Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> My name is Cameron Dye. I'm a government account manager with Cox Business, and I'd like to welcome you to the Collaboration Theater at the FCA Defensive Cyber Operations Symposium. This session is entitled Enterprise Voice Unclassified and Classified Voice Services. Um, this is a, a session that, that you receive, can receive credits for, so make sure that the lady in the back who's got her hand up there, she's got a little iPad for scanning your, scanning your QR reader here, so make sure you get that together. So this afternoon we're going to hear from Marie E. Sakowitz. Ms. Sakowitz is the Program Manager, Enterprise Voice Services Directorate for the Defense Information Systems Agency. She currently serves as the Chief of the Enterprise Service Branch in the Applications Division for DISA. Please help me welcome Ms. Sakowitz to the podium. Thank you, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for coming to take the time to learn about Enterprise Voice Services and also the benefits of using Enterprise Voice Services in um, the mission. So I am Marie Sakowitz. I have been the PM for Enterprise Voice Services for the last year. Um, before that, I was with the DISA Cloud Services branch. I was managing the MillCloud 1.0, VDI, and Storage as a Service programs. The Enterprise Voice program has evolved this last year into operational service. We've been working hard to stabilize and, of course, enhance the capability that's available to all mission partners. We um, are here to re help be a solution to replace legacy telecom. As a little background, DISA decided to implement the, and offer the Enterprise Voice over IT program in 2013. It's to, it'll be a good replacement for those TDM and like I said, the legacy telecom solutions that all are being phased out. Late last spring was when we brought on our first users to the program and as of now, we're up to 40,000. Enterprise Voice Services contains a group of capabilities available to our mission partners today. Um, we are on the Department of Defense Information Network, so available through the Nippernet. This slide shows our different capabilities that we have in the portfolio, and we do fall under DISA Unified Capabilities portfolio. The Defense Switch Network and TDM Voice and Video Services co currently used in DOD-wide have reached end of life in terms of supportability and supporting our warfighters. In 2010, the DOD Chief Information Officer directed the implementation of Defense Information Systems Network unified capabilities to move towards internet protocol techno technologies for assured voice, video, data services to replace those legacy telecom solutions. DISA delivers enterprise voice in an as-a-service model that includes the operations, your help desk services, your ongoing sustainment, and onboarding support of the warfighter and all the supporting combat commands, services, and agencies. The capabilities under the Enterprise Voice Services include Voice over IP, which is the eVoip, on the Nippernet and Sippernet, so the SNP Sippernet offering is called EC VoIP. This is your standard IP phone service. It's delivered via SIP traffic and supports both hard and soft phone. The service is connected to DSN and commercial networks as well. The SipperNet capability is called EasyVoip. It's the same capability that eVoip delivers except on the classified network and that supports up to the secret level. EasyVoip is the oldest capability in our portfolio and it's a proven low cost way of making classified calls, calls across a large enterprise environment. So it replaces having to buy those DS and um, Vipers, which can be very expensive. Enterprise voice conferencing, audio conferencing, that's provided on the unclassified telecom service as well, and it's available to the whole DOD. Mission partners are able to get a bridge line assigned to them to use anytime they need it. It's accessible from commercial and DSN networks, and it also has the standard conferencing control features that you're used to today. It's available in CONUS and OCONUS locations. The, the last one on the slide here is our, our VISP capability, so that's our voice ISP, and that's a centralized connection to the commercial SIP trunk providers for the DOD. The goal of this program was to reduce 
and prevent the DOD entities from getting and paying their own local IP connections to commercial carriers. And the VIS service is secured to prevent those cyber threats. So that's another benefit of using DISA VISP. Any questions on these? All right, we're moving on to the next one. The enterprise voice over IP and classified voice over IP provides that centralized hosted solution and it's available to Department of Defense mission partners and connected to the Nippernet and Cipernet. They're both globally available, they're scalable, they're reliable, and they're very secure. Mission partners procure and maintain the hard phones or they can use soft phones. Soft phones would further reduce the cost to the mission partners. The solution can be deployed on existing LAN infrastructure. So following network routing configuration and WAN circuit activations, then you would be able to connect into the service. Our onboarding team, they provide guided service configuration details and they work directly with all the mission partners to connect to the service. The cost of, for eVoIP and eCVoIP are covered under the DIS and IS rates. So if the mission partners are already connected to the Nippernet or Cipernet and paying into DIS and IS, this service is available to them. DISA operates and maintains the service the reducing the, by reducing the cost for locally implemented and those maintained UC infrastructure and reducing the on-premise hardware solutions. The mission partners will still have to complete their own ads, move changes, and also provide touch labor to those phones in their local enclaves. Tier, tickets can be opened with DISA Service Desk for any issues that come up while using the service. So we do, like I said, provide that operational support and tier two, tier two level support. That way the mission partner only has to maintain the phones and they can focus on their missions. The enterprise voice capabilities contain a group of different, uh, um, sorry. <laughs> sorry. This slide here is the, shows the different um, features inside the enterprise voice capabilities. So everything in the green shows is in eVoIP. So the red specifically are the pieces that are only in eCVoIP. So the green again covers all those features including in the red, but the red is just on the classified side. Both eVoIP and eCVoIP services provide the full suite of voice features to include your call wait, your call hold, call transfer, forwarding, conferencing, voicemail, and of course many more. The next feature down there on the list is um, extension mobility. So extension mobility is where a user is assigned their number and a PIN and they can log into any phone that has extension mobility enabled. This is very helpful like if in an area where you have hot seating. The next one on the list there is the security. So eVoIP and eCVoIP are very secure. That's the benefit of using an enterprise service. There's a separate IP address space used for the voice traffic to separate it out. And it additionally helps reduce the amount of latency or jitter on the line because there's, you're not competing with the data traffic. The soft client is available on eVoIP and it'll be coming soon in the eCVoIP capability. Soft clients or soft phone Soft phones can be used for users to take or place calls wherever they are as long as they have internet connections. The soft client application also allows users to customize settings such as speed dials, contact lists, call forwarding, and some voicemail settings. The soft client su supports XMPP, Federation for Instant Messaging, chat, presence, and allows for interoperability across UC systems. Right now, the soft client users are only able to see other eVoIP users. However, as more DoD users onboard to the service, the directory will expand. And it won't be just particular, like right now you have solutions for Army, Air Force, Navy, but this one is DoD wide. So as everyone onboards, there'll be additional users. The last feature there is the MLPP. So that is the multi-level precedence and preemption. This allows your senior leaderships to be able to replace preempt routine phone calls. So it's helpful if senior leaders need to make a phone call when there was a, 
uh, busy time or a real world situation. This slide is the high level architecture overview of the service. In the middle, you'll see the DISN. So that's the NipperNet on the unclassed side, and of course, the SipperNet on the, the classified side. The eVoIP and the eCVoIP services are both delivered in, to this common transport for the DOD. So if there, anyone's connected to the DISN, obviously you're able to reach these serve services. There's no longer a need, need to maintain separate transport for your voice traffic. This was part of the DOD direction for unified capabilities going forward. Starting at the bottom of the slide here, we show the unclassified eVoIP enclave and connected to the DISN. And then also in that same enclave, we have the in Enterprise Audio Conferencing Service, which is maintained as well for DOD mission partners. Moving up along the side there, we have the Voice ISP service. And that's pictured and connected to the DISN. And it's available to on the e, it's available for eVoIP users, but also any other DISN connected mission partners. So this service is really where mission partners are able to connect their local session controllers to DISA and the transport layer for them is through the voice ISP. On the top left, there's the mission partner enclaves and their endpoints. A note here is we show the two different um, security boundaries here. One is the customer edge routers where the mission partners are still responsible for maintain their boundary and then also JRSS. So JRSS is when DISA takes over that um, security point. We do have configurations for both so even if you haven't moved behind JRSS, eVoIP is accessible to both capabilities. For eCVoIP, that's the red stuff on the bottom left there and that is also on the DISN, but SipperNet, of course. The mission partners maintain three edge, their edge routers and, of course, their endpoints and connect to the service just by opening, fire, opening firewall ports. Any questions on the on, um, architecture? This slide is our global presence slide, so it depicts where we are located throughout the world. Right now, the um, eVoIP, they're the green locations. We are in CONUS, we're in Europe, we're in Southwest Asia, and also the PAC region. So there's each of the configurations, they're set up in geo-redundant pairs, so if one area loses network connectivity, the service would pick up at the geo-redundant pair. If um, the service, if the customer enclave does become disconnected from DISN, you would lo lose calling capabilities unless there was local survivability put in place. Right now, we have about 16 organizations on the eVoIP capability, and that's around 40,000 users today. eCVoIP, there's about 82 organizations on this, and about 8,000. I think last count, we might even be closer to 10,000. The projected growth for FY18 is there, so we're expecting to onboard another 75,000 users for eVoIP and then eCVoIP another 15,000. Why use enterprise services? So the DOD put out a memo July of 2017. This tasked all components to develop a plan to phase out their TDM and their non-IP technologies by FY23. So DISA voice over IP services are an alternative for these legacy telecom replacements. Using an enterprise service provides a proven transition plan and quickly addresses the ability for mission partners to move off old legacy telecoms. Many entities right now within the DOD, they're starting their network modernization. And once the IP networks are implemented and available, it's easy just to open the ports and protocols needed to join the enterprise service. Since the eVoIP solutions are a as a service, the mission partners do not need to implement their full voice over IP solution locally. This provides cost savings across the DOD and allows components to focus right on their missions. So this slide is a good cost comparison. I do want to note here that it's just um, for used for estimates and it's not really a good 
business case. So we did do a quick estimate on about 5,000 users, and if it was, this would be the cost to put it up locally on site and versus using an enterprise service. So after we um, calculated it, it was about 46% of the cost for an on-site solution over five years you'd be saved. And that represents a cost avoidance of about $4.7 million. And once you start multiplying that across the DOD, every base, post, camp, and station, those cost savings in the DOD grow exponentially. Although many components are currently receiving their phone sys services off the installation level, Changing to IP is going to be done more locally, and there could be cases where we have multiple voice over IP services at the same installation. So again, using an enterprise service is a big benefit to the DOD. This chart goes through some of the costs that would be um, used when you're trying to figure out if you're going to use an on-site solution or if you want to you choose an enterprise solution. So we kind of broke it down here on the things that go into maintaining, sustaining, implementing a service. So there's labor we have on the top row there. That's your sysadmins for monitoring, patching, your app and DB support, security of course. Right now we just put in a cost of two FTEs for this solution. This is about, I think the costs were based on 5,000 users. So around 200K a year per FTE. And in an enterprise voice services, you'd be getting that service provided for you. So you wouldn't have to keep those system administrators and other support on staff. For hardware, the physical endpoints are the same in both solutions because you're going to need to maintain a phone for a choose soft client. And right now, phones are around 300 a unit. Um, on the on site solution, you have servers, which is around 600K per system for 120K a year to maintain. In the voice, enterprise voice services, we take care of all the sustainment of the hardware. Software, you still have licenses in both solutions, so that cost is about the same. Help desk, on a on-site solution, you need to have your tier one, your tier two, tier three, and of course, the local support. In the enterprise voice service, you still would have to maintain the tier one support, and which is around 120K a year for one FTE, and the support personnel to maintain the phones locally and of course to do all your ads, moves, and changes, which is still a mission partner responsibility. Facilities, we just put some estimates here of what the power and floor space cost per year, and then of course at DISA, the floor space and power is covered under the enterprise service. Tier three support, again here is just an FTE cost per person per year, and then vendor engineering costs, and then of course on the enterprise service side, it's provided by the service. Training, these are some numbers, we're just estimates if you need a training to train your people or your technicians that'll be maintain the solution. And then enterprise service, we do offer a bunch of training aids, training classes, those things are provided by the service. You can also purchase extra training from us, but that's an additional cost. So bottom line here, we show the total implementation cost of on-site around 3.8 million, and using an enterprise service, it's about 2.7. So keep in mind here, the, the bulk of the cost for implementation is going to be your endpoint devices. So 5,000 users times $300 per endpoint device, that's how those costs grew so quickly. And then, but your real cost savings here is under the sustainment. So almost 1.9 million for sustaining a local solution versus using an enterprise service around 600K a year. So you times that out five years, you're going to see the savings quickly. The Enterprise Voice Service Program has a whole team dedicated to onboarding. We follow you through the whole process, so we're going to be spending a lot of the time with the mission partners in this process. We are there from the first contact and all the way to the cutover. They have a standardized process, standardized process and they're able to help each entity determine the requirements and the solution that's best for that mission partner. During the requirements gathering phase, multiple meetings are held to walk through the solution and fill out requirements like the site surveys and any other documentation that needs to be obtained. The site survey is really important in this part process because that's going to determine how many phones, licenses, what features your, user, your users are going to need. Also, if needed, we can provide additional engineering services to help do a network survey. This would be an additional cost, but it's very be beneficial if the component does not have the network engineers to actually determine how much 
latency or in bandwidth you have on your network. The next phase there is the customer acquisition phase. So once your requirements are determined and the phones and licenses are orders, uh, the order should be placed. So this is usually done through a BPA vehicle. So right now most mission partners are using NASA Soup, but there's other vehicles out there that they can procure their phones from. At the same time, the phones are ordered, their the service order will be placed too. So this is done through DISA storefront. The onboarding team will provide all the details and the process for ordering to make sure this all goes smoothly. Same with the circuit procurements and the network configurations. We have guides and all those details for everything that needs, needs to be done on the customer side to make sure that the connection to the enterprise service is smooth. We know that sometimes this is just a second d duty for the person that's working with our team to get on the enterprise service. So we want to make sure it's as seamless as possible. Once we get to that final stage af after all the acquisition and access and everything is opened up, we schedule a transition date with your team. So right now you would have your phones, everything's been placed, the network's been opened, and then we schedule that transition, transition date. And our team will work directly with the customer team to make sure that when the cutover happens, there's testing that's done, make sure everything's working, we troubleshoot any issues. And also during this cutover is when the numbers would be ported, if you're porting numbers over, or if you're getting new numbers, they'd be available at that time. The next service in our portfolio is the voice internet service provider, that's the VISP. The VISP provides a full service commercial calling capability. So this is your local, your long distance, your international, emergency, inbound, outbound calling. It is a DOD low cost alternative to obtaining commercial dial tone locally. The primary goal for VISP is to provide cybersecurity for the DOD and of course avoid a scenario where the DOD components are establishing thousands of IP connections to the phone carriers as they replace their TDM trunks and basically opening back doors to the network. VISP is the glue to say that allows the IP-based carriers to reach an IP session controller on the Nippernet. So this is those local session controllers that the mission partners have. VISP is the way to get the commercial access. Using DISA VISP is the enterprise preferred way to obtain your SIP access to the public switch telephone network, your, your PSTN. eVoIP uses VISP to get the commercial access as well. DOD mission partners can connect a local session controller to the DISA VISP program and get commercial telecom access for the users and endpoints. Mission partners all over the DOD are taking advantage of this program and currently the eVoIP team is working with more than 75 different entities to get them the commercial calling capability that they need. The real cost benefit comes from the reduction of sustaining local PRIs or T1s for commercial calling. One PRI is around $500 a month. And also there's some cost Cost benefits can be received using VIS from not needing to install direct circuits, not needing to create contracts, and you don't have to undergo the extensive security certification for the network. VIS capabilities. So access and calls on these are on the unclassified network. Like I said, they're connected to the DISN. It pr provides those commercial calling features like um, long distance, local, international, emergency, inbound, outbound. And you also have access to the on net calling. So this is being able to still make DSN calls and of course getting to other users that are connected through the DISN, through their local session controllers. It's a low cost rate per minute per call connecting out to the commercial PT PSTN. You're able to port over your existing numbers if you have them, or you can request new ones. And it's available to Verizon serviced area, that's in CONUS, UCOM, and PACOM. Basic 911 features are with this service, but E911 is available, and it's a, that's with an option of on-premise E911 solution, and it's a di additional implementation, and it's usually a third-party vendor. Um, right now, the VISP is billed through the DIS and IS, but the program designator code there at the bottom there, that's how the billing has occurred. So each customer 
puts in their PDC code, and then they received a monthly ba bill from the DISN. VISP ordering. So this is the same kind of phase that we went through on the Evoy program. It's a little simpler because it's just connecting to the commercial. So the team works with um, the mission partners to determine what numbers they want to use, their bandwidth, how many calls is going to be made. We discuss requirements with you. We work on network architecture. We also have a VISP questionnaire that's filled out with each mission partner. Once all that data is gathered, we'll move into that configuring access stage. That's where we configure that the SIP trunks to the SBCs on the DISN core. Once the access is there, we'll move into the ordering phase. Same place here. The VISP can be ordered through the DISA storefront. There is also a TSR creation order form, which the onboarding team would help walk everyone through on that. And then finally, once all those steps have been taken, there's a transition where we port the numbers or you receive your new numbers and then work through making sure all the call scenarios are validated on the test and turn up. The last capability in the portfolio is the enterprise audio conferencing. So this is the audio conferencing bridge line service. So you are able to receive an audio conferencing bridge if you're connected to the, the DISN and it's available to everyone in the DOD. It's a low cost alternative to having your own um, audio conferencing bridge locally. Mission partners can request an audio conferencing bridge and it's assigned to them, so it's available any time when they need to have a conference. It um, offers all the standard interpri um, enterprise conferencing features. The lines also have a commercial and a DSN number, so you're able to access off both networks. Audio conferencing solution is available, so local conferencing sol solutions can be eliminated, and there's no cost for the audio conferencing solution from DISA, and it's recovered under DIS and IS as well. As I mentioned, the audio conferencing solution provides those reservation list conference bridges, so there's always available whenever you need to have your meetings, and you don't need to reserve it in advance. They are on the unclassified network, and it has all the features and chair management features as well, so there's ways to mute or s unlock people. You can have starting and ending behaviors. You can also put PIN numbers on it, so if you had meetings that were bumping up against each other, there would be a PIN for the next one so that people are not running into the previous meeting. Right now, the bridges come with 50 participants as standard, but you can request up to 250 as well. So this is our um, contact us page. I have the whole onboarding team here today and they're available to take any questions, comments. Um, we have our depths portal, that's the link there. We keep all our documentation up to date. It's available for anyone to look at or to learn more about the service. We also have email addresses where the enterprise um, voice team is reachable at. We have EC VoIP and eVoIP teams that respond usually within a day. Like I said, we start with the mission partners from that first contact and work with them all the way through the onboarding to the service. So if you had any questions, we'll go ahead and open it up now. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, with regards to um, CPE, edge equipment, gateways, those sorts of things, is that specified by DISA and pushed out or is that relegated to clients to make those decisions on which CPE they want? Yeah, so it depends on the network locally on which um, edge routers and things are implemented. So we don't have specifications for it, that. Each individual end user then is responsible for, for that selection? The uh, end component. So really you're, whoever the end users are on the network, it would be their network folks that would determine which So all of these services were listed in the latest draft of the DOS um, RFP. How is that 
plan to be done? Is that going to be a transition of these services under the DOS program, or is that going to be a re-implementation? So th this will all be in phase two and phase three of DOS. It's not in the phase one RFP that should be coming out soon. Um, it's still to be determined what the transition plan will be, so we don't have all those details yet. And in your estimation, what, what percentage of this was introduced in 2017 or the requirement, right? So what percentage of sites have been have uh, implemented so far? So really we've been working this year with DLA and DISA customers, but we're reaching out to Army, Air Force, Navy. So right now we have very small footprint compared to what the DOD wide numbers are. Any additional questions? Like, go ahead. Um, in regards to the VISP, what kind of voice security do you have in there? So we are implemented at the IAP, so the traffic does run through the IAP, and um, it's behind the NFG. So that's where the secure um, sensing is done. That's data security though, right? The uh, Dennis, I have Dennis here, he could probably speak to that a little bit more. <laughs> We have an SBC out there, which is like the voice firewall, so that handles the voice portion. SBCs aren't really exactly like voice firewalls. Is there somebody we can talk to? Okay. Uh, they were saying that um, it, the traffic goes to the SBC, so the firewall does the sensing. They're going to meet after the session and talk. <laughs> Any other questions? The whole team will be available at the distance pavilion. Well, one person will be available all day long at the distance pavilion tomorrow and Thursday. So if you did have additional questions on the service, you can stop by the pavilion and just ask for the eVoip rep there. And they're happy to talk to you. Like I said, we do have the email address here. I have a few business cards if you want to come by and talk to me specifically offline. Thank you all for attending. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, there's three sessions here tomorrow. First one is at 8.15, uh, 10.45, and 1.15 here tomorrow. Thank you.